10 minutes after takeoff, an Airbus A319 that was passing flight level 340 lost its autopilot and auto trust. Three ECAM alerts showed up to the party. Auto flight, autopilot off, auto flight, auto trust off, engine trust lock. On the PFD, there were no FD bars. The NAV GPS position disagree came out twice, but the pilots did not notice this. The pilots then did something most people would do. They re-engaged the autopilot and auto trust five minutes later. But the pilots noticed that something was wrong with the IRS position on the MCDU position monitor page. And so they decided to continue the flight with ATC helping them with their navigation. But during an ILS approach, the autopilot and auto trust disconnected at 4,000 feet and the pilot abandoned the approach. On the second approach, they decided to fly a manual approach using radio navigation and they safely landed the plane. The question is, what in the world just happened? First off, why did the autopilot and auto trust got disconnected? That happened because there was a severe drift on all three IRSs. During the climb, the first IRS was rejected by the auto flight system. And then the discrepancy between the two remaining IRS led to both IRS being rejected. This caused the plane to be confused. The plane does not know which reading is correct, just like you don't know which girl is right for you. The IRS drift then reduced and remained stable during the flight, but on the approach, it increased again, causing the autopilot and auto trust to trip again. The truth is, the IRS drift started during the takeoff roll. There were some abnormal shocks and high vibrations sent to three ADIRUs, the three ADATAS by the nose landing gear. This caused the IRS to start drifting out of its normal envelope. As it turns out, the nose landing gear shock absorber was overinflated during its last service. This made the shock absorber more stiff and reduced its ability to absorb impacts and vibrations. It is like someone who has an inflated ego, so high and mighty and unable to absorb criticisms and has a stiff upper lip. And so, the vibrations from the shock absorber got transferred to the aircraft structure. Where is the ADIRUs located? Well, you guess it right. It is situated in the avionics bay behind the nose landing gear bay. So these ADIRUs got disturbed by the vibrations during the takeoff roll. Now let us look at shock absorber servicing. All Airbus aircrafts uses oleo pneumatic shock absorbers. It means they use both oil, which is hydraulic fluid, and gas, which is nitrogen. The combination of both of these will absorb and dissipate the shocks during taxi, takeoff, and landing. There is this book that acts as a guide called the Maintenance Planning Document. In this book, it tells us about the regular checks of the nitrogen pressure and also the quantity of the hydraulic fluid in each shock absorber. Therefore, routine checks on the nitrogen pressure and hydraulic quantity must be done. The question is why? What are the consequences if there is an incorrect shock absorber servicing? If the shock absorber is too stiff, the vibrations will propagate to the aircraft structure. If the shock absorber is too soft, the shocks can cause damage to the landing gear and the airframe. The nose landing gear may rotate when you retract the flaps. Apologies. The nose landing gear may rotate when you retract the gears or even turn in the nose landing gear bay. ECAM alerts like landing gear shock absorber fault can be triggered and certain avionics functions can be lost. The question is when to check the tyre pressure. Airbus recommends that the aircraft has to rest for 2 hours after its last aircraft operations. Two reasons for this. Number one, effect of the temperature. The pressure of nitrogen will change according to the temperature of the shock absorber. During cruise, the landing gear bay is at a very low temperature. But once the aircraft lands, the shock absorber quickly compress and there are many quick movements involved. This will quickly increase the temperature. Number two, emulsion effect. As mentioned, the shock absorber contains 
both gas and liquid. When the plane lands, the gas and fluid will mix together. This emulsion will affect the pressure level and the temperature of the shock absorber. And so, it will take time for the gas and oil to separate and for the temperature to stabilize. Only then, the maintenance guy can check for the correct hydraulic fluid levels and nitrogen gas pressure. Sometimes, we might need to adjust how much nitrogen we use based on the pressure. On certain planes like the A220, A320 and A350, we intentionally put a bit more nitrogen. This is because some of the nitrogen mixes with the hydraulic fluid. It can cause the struts to be shorter. But don't worry, it stabilizes after a few days. When we squeeze a gas, its molecules can move more freely through the liquid it is in contact with. This happens inside the shock absorber of the aircraft. When the shock absorber is extended, the pressure of the gas drops. When the aircraft is on the ground, the struts becomes compressed. One more challenge when you are adjusting the nitrogen pressure is stiction. Because the friction with the shock absorber housing, the sliding cylinder will stick. This will lead to incorrect servicing. How to solve this problem? Well, you jack up the plane and leave the wheels hanging. Then you are able to accurately pressurize the gears. When it comes to shock absorber hydraulic fluid replenishment, waiting two hours after the last aircraft operation is crucial. The reason is due to the emulsion effect as mentioned earlier. The shock absorber needs to be deflated to check the fluid level. If it is done too soon, there will still be nitrogen mixed in the hydraulic fluid. Rapid depressurization can cause bubbles to be ejected and cause injury to mankind. This will also cause a loss in hydraulic fluid and we would need to top up the fluid later on. Once the shock absorber is fully deflated, opening the charging valve as slowly as possible will prevent fluid loss. The shock absorber will be compressed to see if any fluids comes out of the charging valve. If no fluid comes out, then the fluid level is low and needs to be adjusted accordingly. After you fill up the shock absorber with hydraulic fluid, the gear is compressed to check the quantity. If foam comes out, then more fluid is added and the shock absorber is compressed again. Repeat this process until there is no more foam oozing out. Now, after you refill the shock absorber, how do you extract nitrogen from the hydraulic fluid? Without boring you to death, in short, what they do is open the pressure valve slowly and compress the shock absorber fully. When the pressure valve is closed, the shock absorber can extend under its own weight. This creates a vacuum effect and would draw the nitrogen gas molecules out of the hydraulic fluid. Then, the shock absorber is inflated with the correct quantity of nitrogen. This method is only accurate if the gears are being jacked up. But if the aircraft is on ground, there is this extra weight on the wheels. To solve this, Airbus has created a liquid and nitrogen charging equipment or lens for short. This card can correctly measure the hydraulic fluid level and also replenish with the exact quantity of nitrogen. Pretty cool. One more thing that I want to highlight is landing gear lubrication. Proper lubrication is needed as there are a lot of friction involved, if you know what I mean. Grease is injected through the grease nipples using an electrical or manual grease pump. If there is fresh grease seen popping out, that means there is enough grease. Do note that some parts fresh grease might not be visible. Question is, is it wrong to put too much grease? The answer is yes. For example, on the A320, the main landing gear uplock hook needs to be lubricated, but it may be difficult to see how much grease is being applied. Therefore, excess quantities of grease can lead to an ECAM alert. Landing gear not uplock for the Airbus A320. In summary, correct maintenance of shock absorbers is important and putting the right amount of hydraulic fluids, nitrogen and finally grease will ensure 
safety of the aircraft. The best way to perform precise shock absorber servicing is to jack up the aircraft. If unable, then use Airbus equipment called LANS. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next video.